Today I am quite glammed up and I'm really excited because I actually glammed up for my guests. Um, for people who know me, I am a lover of fashion. I, I watch runway shows. I always have like an eye on what's trending. I try to make it my own. And um, I just believe that fashion is so powerful in our societies and um, can do so much in our lives. We live in it and we express ourselves through it. So I was thinking with my perspective on fashion and my love for fashion and what it does for me, who can I speak to in an interesting discussion about it? And I came across the brilliant Hafsa Lodi. And she is joining us from Dubai. She's a journalist that has written a book called Modesty, A Fashion Paradox. But her expertise is not only in fashion, which is also fascinating to me because she has a master's in Islamic law and she also has done tons of work and uh, research on issues of um, South Asian uh, women violence and has done reporting on cases that are outside of fashion. So to see someone as passionate about social justice and fashion at the same time, this conversation is going to be great. So welcome, Hafsa Lodi. How are you? Good. I mean, you're saying, you're saying you got glammed up for me. I put my lipstick on for you today. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. In uh, months, it feels like. <laughs> Look at that. So let's dig uh, really into it very quickly. Um, can fashion be used for the empowerment of women? Definitely. And I think my, my book, Modesty, A Fashion Paradox, that's one of the messages that I try to convey in it. Because many people think that covering up, whether it's for religious or other reasons, is kind of um, synonymous with being oppressed or repressed or um, under control of men um, and part of this whole patriarchal system. And while that definitely is the case in some areas, in some families, in some countries in the world, this modest fashion movement that's been rising um, and gaining momentum over the past decade, really, is all about female empowerment and female calling, females calling the shots um, about how they want to look and how they want to be portrayed by society. And the, I guess at the crux of the movement is this message that covering up uh, your skin is kind of a rejection of the societal standards that kind of deem a woman's amount of skin that she shows to be kind of the standards by which she's measured in terms of attractiveness. So yes, if you're kind of covering up rather than showing it off, it's definitely empowering. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, there's two things that you stated. One thing that there's a misconception that people that are drawn to modesty are somehow oppressed or come from a certain culture or a certain religion, which is untrue because it is a multi-billion dollar industry that women all over the world are embracing. And one of the reasons is because they're calling the shots and how they want to present themselves. Yeah. So this comes to the question of the evolution of fashion right and who created the models of fashion to begin with so who do you think that not, what was was calling the shots let's say 30 40 50 years ago on women's fashion I think historically the fashion industry has been dominated by men and we're seeing that even in the past um, 10 20 years the big designers of the big fashion houses are are men and Women originally, you're saying 30 years ago, we had this kind of women's revolution where we wanted to stop wearing long dresses and start wearing pantsuits and be more like men so we could you know, gain some kind of equality in terms of how we are perceived by society. And that definitely happened. But also what also happened is that men, male designers being kind of in charge of how fashion is being dictated on like a mainstream global level started to sexualize women's bodies a lot. And um, on runways and in, in the fashion and film and entertainment industries, sex sells. That's kind of like a mantra that's been ongoing. So we're starting to see a shift away from that. I know the Victoria's Secret um, annual fashion show that usually takes place every year was canceled in 2019. And there's some kind of link, I think, to the greater movement towards modesty. And I mean, it's the result of a lot of things, the Me Too movement and I mean, logistics and finances and this global pandemic as well. But I definitely think um, we're seeing more women, female designers now of, I mean, look at uh, Dior, we have now a powerful female in charge there. And so it's very, it's, I think it's very representative of who is 
at the top uh, in power in the fashion industry. So this, starting- is great. So, so this is good news. This is good news. And yes. if I can go back, because you touched on a, a little bit, so I want to make a timeline for the audience so they can see. So, you know, we're talking about, let's say, let's say in the Western world, there's like a beginning of early 70s, late 60s, I would say early 70s, where women are going into the workforce. They're going into the workforce and many of those requirements for a long time, as recently as 15 years ago, was that the women should wear pencil skirts, you know, instead of pants if they're going to be in the firm setting or the corporate setting. And so if, if you work in our domain, the male domain, because it can't be yours, it's our intellect, our game that you're joining, then we have to tell you how you dress. And so it started like that. And then women said, no, it's not even comfortable for me. Uh, I would like to wear pantsuits. And then they decided to wear pantsuits. And then it became about, you'll take me more seriously if I wore pantsuits, right? And then we see a trend of like, stop telling me what to wear altogether. So now we're going to just take everything off and you're not going to be able to tell me what I can show and what I don't want to show. And now we're at this very interesting spot where we are analyzing female leadership across industries, including fashion, and how the different messages from all different industries have played a role in keeping women lower than where they should be as far as leadership. So, you know, this is the argument of like, why have we not had a female president in the United States, right? When all around the world there's female. So it's like those leadership models are missing and what role does fashion play? So we see the same evolution of fashion. So let me ask you this. If this is a multi-billion dollar industry and people are catching on, what is the narrative you think that a young girl hears when she says, hmm, modest fashion, what, what does that actually mean and what does it do? How would you describe it? So I would describe, so modest fashion is, it's kind of become a really loaded buzzword in the industry because a lot of women are not happy with the word modest because of the negative kind of connotations it may hold. Um, especially when it comes to then what's the opposite of modest people. Some women say that what, if, if I don't wear modest fashion, am I immodest? Am I impure? Am I immoral? So, I mean, that's kind of one um, linguistics debate with it, but how I tend to d- define um, modest fashion is generally it covers the shoulders and oftentimes it reaches up to the wrists um, and it covers the knees, oftentimes up to the ankles. Um, necklines are moderately higher Uh, sometimes reaching up to the chin like with turtlenecks. There are no plunging necklines. Uh, Hair is sometimes covered as well. And silhouettes are generally loose and unfitting and unfitted and non-transparent. A lot of people have this misconception, and I'm so glad that you're here to clarify it, that modesty fashion is somehow only tied to faith or people that observe a certain faith or people that have faith guidelines. It may be conveniently perfect fit for them, but what does it do for a woman's self-esteem and empowerment in general in your mind? Yeah, so I, while researching for the book, I came across this article on Refinery29. I think it was written by Connie Wang. And she, this is when modest fashion was slowly starting to become a trend. And she had written something along the lines of, a lot of women have asked her um, for help in shopping for clothing for maybe a big board meeting or maybe an interview or a visit to their grandparents. And that modest fashion was naturally the clothing of choice for these occasions. But if she, she couldn't call it modest to these, these women, because if wow. she said modest, suddenly there were connotations of, and I remember she said religious cult like apparel. That was kind of the, the thought that came along with modest fashion. But yeah, it's definitely kind of losing that religious um, tag. And while many women of faith might are definitely buying modest fashion, it's become so much, so much bigger than that. It's become, um, and so much more than a trend. It's just becoming, um, like what you said, uh, what it, why are women, why are women dressing modestly? It's for empowerment, but why? What's empowering about it? It's comfortable. These clothes that male designers have been making us, like these bodycon dresses and these super tight latex skirts, <laughs> all of these, they, they, look, they might look attractive in the sense that they outline your female body and they look like the actresses and reality TV stars we see on TV, but they're not comfortable. And I think that's the biggest premise of the modest fashion movement is being comfortable, whether that's like a oversized t-shirt or a loose, whimsical, feminine dress that 
is like a prairie dress. Some people, I mean, the, the word used to be a prairie dress, which also yeah. kind of has negative connotations. But now these clothes are stylish and fashion forward. And it's because they're comfortable that people are wearing them, that women are wearing them. So and let's, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So just add, you don't have to feel kind of insecure about something like, oh, is my, is this too tight? And is this showing? And I need to pull this and itch at that. Everything's just kind of, you're protected. It's kind of like you're feeling just, you're in your own world in your garment. <laughs> so um, I know that you you actually cover a lot of different topics. Fashion, it seems like, is one of your passions and your interests as well. And there's so many different trends and you are a busy mom, I'm assuming, but you would like to get your voice heard. You wrote a book and I'm so glad that you did. How do you balance everything? And, and knowing that fashion changes so quickly and trends change so quickly, how do you keep your pulse on what your passion is about in fashion? What keeps you moving forward? in your work yeah so I honestly I maybe two years ago three years ago I got really disheartened with fashion I loved being a fashion journalist but how much can you talk about the season's trend that season's trend red blue cheetah print athletic I mean it just I got kind of sick of it and that's when I um, quit my full-time job as a fashion reporter and went freelance um, I, I just naturally, like as it was like a complete coincidence that this book landed in my hands. Um, I was commissioned to write it by Name Tree Press, the publisher, she's London based. She'd seen that I'd written a lot about modest fashion and she asked if I'd like to write a book about it. So I was thrilled that I could get back into this writing about fashion, but for this higher purpose. It wasn't just about um, the frivolous like aesthetics of fashion. It was about female empowerment. It was about politics. It was about religion, it was about culture. And I've always really, really been fascinated by the points where these kind of topics intersect, like uh, women's issues and politics and the appearance of women, specifically Muslim women, um, how the image of, uh, how kind of Muslim women have been represented in the mainstream media in the West. So yeah, that's kind of, my passion is kind of where all these things collide. Intersect. Intersect yes. and they merge. You know what? Um, thank you for being so thorough in your answer because it gave me, it gave me a little bit of a um, wow moment hearing you speak because you know who you are, the live version of who you are. You are, I believe her name is Annie from Devil, Devil Wears Prada. You really are because you are this journalist. <laughs> And Hathaway, because, oh. that character, because you have all these interesting ideas and you're trained in a certain way in journalism and you dropped yourself in fashion and then you made it your own. So it's, it's, it's just, just watch it. <laughs> you got to watch it. You get to see yourself. You get to see yourself. I mean, in, in, in many ways, in some ways not, but in many ways. So <laughs> that's really incredible. I, I just love the connection we just made on that. <laughs> So um, thank you so much for joining me and thank you for taking the time to speak to me and thank you for uh, letting me glam up today. Thank you. For you. <laughs> and, and, and bringing so much depth and so much intellect and so much um, of a different type of angle uh, to fashion where we can talk about it intelligently and, and you reminding us how to be consumers who call the shots and how we can encourage designers uh, to have women so they can call the shots. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, I bid you peace.